Well, good morning to you. Welcome to Morning Mail for today, Friday, November the 12th, 2021. It's good to be with you this morning. For this last Morning Mail for the week, we're going to be looking at the book of Philemon, verses 12 through 16, and talk a little bit about some comments Paul makes there regarding fellowship and the bond of fellowship. Let's get started, though, with prayer, and then we'll get right into that discussion. Gracious Father, thank you so much for the day that you've blessed us with and you're watching over us. I pray, Father, that you be with us today as we spend this, this few moments this morning in looking into your word, but not only now. Father, we pray you be with us throughout all the day and all of our lives. Thank you so much for the record that you've recorded of your guidance and instruction in the, in the Bible for the men that were inspired by your Holy Spirit to write this all down and the preservation of it to this day, that we might be encouraged and uplifted, that we might be in, taught your way and know how to live each day. Father, thank you for Jesus coming and dying upon the cross and giving his life that we might have life. And I pray, Father, today that we will live as your children. Be with those who are in need of our prayers, whether it be for physical reasons or spiritual, and help us, Father, to do what we can to help them. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to get started with a relating a uh, true story, I guess you'd call, to, uh, to you. I read about a missionary in Africa who told of a rite that he observed among a particular tribe. It seems that there were two men who wanted to take upon themselves what they called a brother rite. To do this, they sat face to face with each other, their legs crossed, holding in their laps instruments of war. A sheep or a goat was sacrificed, its heart was roasted, and each took half of the heart. They cut one of their own veins and allowed the blood to be caught and rubbed on a similar wound on the other individual. Now this rite signified that henceforth they were halves are parts of the other. Each through his own blood was absorbed into the other. From then on, if either should be in trouble, the other was to think, it is myself that is in trouble, and do whatever he could to assist the other. What a good illustration of the beauty and blessings of brotherly fellowship. In Christ, we become a part of one another. This is a principle stressed by Christ in Matthew 25, verse 40. This wonderful fellowship is a bond drawing us closer than flesh and blood. Matthew 10, verses 34 to 39. This wonderful fellowship is a union of heart, soul, goals, and dreams. This marvelous fellowship is open to all and will unite all in a perfect oneness with Christ. See Ephesians 2, verses 21, 22 and 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. This marvelous fellowship in the New Testament church was a trait that distinguished it early in its history. Tertullian, a Christian writer in the second century, wrote in his Apologetics, page 39, quote, The heathen are wont to exclaim with wonder, See how these Christians love one another? For they, the heathen, hate one another. And 
how they are ready to die for one another. For they, the heathen, are more ready to kill one another. End of quote. The fellowship associations of the early Christians presented radical changes in the usual practices of that time. See Galatians 3, verses 28-29, and Colossians 3, verse 10, verses 10 and 11. The present paragraph we're considering in Philemon, verses 12-16, to 16, provides a good illustration of the radical nature of this brotherly fellowship. Paul, a Jewish scholar, is writing to Philemon, a Gentile businessman, pleading the cause of a runaway slave, Onesimus. Ordinarily, these three would have, would have had no unnecessary contact with one another. But now, because of brotherly fellowship ties, they are all brothers. The book of Philemon was written to explain to Philemon the goals of fellowship in Christ and encourage him to accept them. The congregation at Colossae shared the joys of brotherly fellowship, Colossians 2 verse 2. But when Onesimus returned back to Philemon there in Colossae, a special problem would arise. And Paul wanted that problem solved immediately. The great love of Philemon, we saw in verses 4 through 7, could be ruined by bitterness resulting from past personal injuries. In offering counsel on the situation, Paul identifies the singular goal of fellowship in Christ. This singular goal toward which all brotherly fellowship is directed can be summed up in, with one word, unity. See Romans 12, 15, verses 15 and 16, the first part of 16. Revelation 21, verses 24 to 27. Philemon needed to remember the beautiful goal of Christian fellowship, unity and harmony with all brethren. This fellowship bond that existed between all believers is distinguished by special features. In verses 12 to 16 of Philemon, five features help us to understand the way fellowship is to be practiced so that unity will result. Let's read those verses before we go any further and before we consider those major features of fellowship. The book of Philemon, verses 12 to 16. Paul, as we begin verse 12, is speaking about the fact he has returned Onesimus to Philemon. Verse 12, I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wished to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So what do we see here? First, we see a binding affection. 
my very heart. Verse 12. Heart was used to refer to the place of deepest emotions, strongest feelings, and most tender attachments. This runaway slave, Onesimus, after obeying the gospel, had become so endeared to Paul that his departure was like tearing Paul's heart out. The separation from a brother in the Lord caused great anguish for Paul. Such is the way we should be affected by the aff affection of brotherly fellowship. It endears us to one another and binds us to each other with cords of loving strength. Although those cords are invisible, they unite and compel us to be long-suffering and forbearing. When the fellowship tie is threatened, it causes us to feel deep, pain, and loss. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. Philippians 4, verse 18. Such an affection is a key trait of all who are in fellowship with God and who share the divine desire of Christian unity. See Psalm 16, verse 3. Romans 12, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 13 to 16, and 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. Mutual strength shared with one another, minister, verse 13, is the second feature of brotherly fellowship. Fellowship in Christ brings about a sharing of strength. Each part relies upon the other for support. The scriptures often state that the Christian strength is, is not found in isolation or solitude, but in its community of unity. Compare Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19 and following. Romans 14, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 23. Romans 1, verse 12, etc. <coughs> Excuse me. Paul's fellowship with Onesimus resulted in the apostle gaining strength. Paul needed him because the company of a brother in the Lord would bring the essential strength to overcome trials. Now, Paul was suffering. As a captive and a stranger, he needed strength the strength that Christian fellowship could provide. This strength, through fellowship, was a priceless treasure for him. Paul's desire for Onesimus to remain with him was due to this feature of brotherly fellowship. Compare Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Consideration for one another Paul expressed it without your consent, verse 14, is the third feature of brotherly fellowship. One of the most visible aspects of the fellowship binding believers is the consideration shown for one another. Compare 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Paul was being considerate of Philemon. He wanted Onesimus to stay with him but he did not want to impose on or run roughshod over Philemon's feelings. Paul shows himself the perfect Christian gentleman, putting aside personal considerations and conveniences in favor of another. This considerate attitude is responsible for promoting the unity among believers that is desired by God. If we are to find this wonderful brotherly fellowship 
in the Lord's church today, we must demonstrate a like sensitivity and consideration for one another. See Romans 14, verse 15b, verse 20, verse 21, and Romans 15, verses 1 and 2. Then there is the eternal scope of Christian fellowship. Verse 15, Paul speaks of forever. That's the fourth feature. The temporary loss of Onesimus had led to everlasting gain. Now, both Philemon and Onesimus, as well as Paul, were eternally related. Philemon and Onesimus could enjoy an affectionate fellowship on earth and anticipate an even greater delight in the fellowship of eternity in heaven. The glorious benefits of this fellowship are delightful to contemplate. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Such eternal joy awaits only those who share in the glorious brotherly fellowship shared by Philemon and Onesimus. Psalm 119, verse 63. Now the final and fifth and final feature of brotherly fellowship is the enhancement of personal worth and value. Verse 16. Much more. Onesimus was returning to Philemon not as a mere slave, but much more than a slave. He was returning as a beloved brother. He was in a different class altogether now. He had gained new dignity as Philemon's equal because he was now a brother in Christ. And all of this happened because or excuse me, all of this happened when he was placed in Christ. And this renewed personal value awaits all who obey God. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. Ephesians 2, verses 11, 12, and 13. And 1 Timothy 2, verses 13 through 16, etc., Today, all are not reckoned valuable by the world. Some are counted worthless. But in Christ, all come to possess value that is priceless. Now, as Paul discussed this marvelous fellowship that he, Philemon, and Onesimus shared he observed that a duty was involved. If this fellowship tie is to bind as tightly as God desires, we must do something. This imperative duty is summed up in the phrase of your own free will. Verse 14b. If our brotherly fellowship is to possess all five features we've just discussed. It is critical that we choose to make it exist. This kind of affectionate relationship does not just happen. The duty to choose because of willful decision, to commit myself in a steadfast way, making this kind of fellowship exist, involves the, the following specifics. First, I must become involved with my brethren. I cannot isolate myself, and I cannot ignore my brethren. Years ago, some church buildings were built with individual closets, and worshipers would not be distracted as they assembled for worship. Each of them would go and sit in their closet, shut off from all the others. Although church buildings are no longer built that way, 
Folks, many people still practice isolation in the assembly. To find the fellowship that Paul described in Philemon, verses 12 to 16 here, we must become involved with our brethren. Second, I must reorder my priorities so that eternity becomes a realistic term in my vocabulary. How depressing to observe the way some Christians live with no apparent concept or desire for eternity. The consequences of such are seen in the lack of spiritual priorities, especially in maintaining and developing fellowship. Third, I must demonstrate genuine affection to all my brethren. Now, this does not mean that I will have the same feelings of love for everyone because I'm going to be closer to some than I am to others. This does not or this does mean that I will guard my attitudes so that I will not fail to support and encourage brethren. See Galatians 5 verse 22 and Colossians 3 verses 10 and 11. Fourth, I must see each Christian as possessing a priceless value. We often see some brethren as more important than others. But this kind of view, biased view, is contrary to God's will. See 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20 to 25. Now Philemon, verse 12, contains a most interesting phrase, sent back. Literally, this referred to a legal case that was being referred back to the courts for a decision. In using this phrase, Paul was presenting Philemon with a hard question. What about brotherly fellowship? Philemon would decide the answer in the way he judged Onesimus. The verdict was up to Philemon. Either he would fellowship Onesimus and thus demonstrate the brotherly fellowship that Christ had died for, or he would not. It could have been difficult for him to decide. What about you? How is your practice of brotherly fellowship going? Philemon verse 12 is a charge to all of us. The case is referred to us, and we must make a verdict, render a verdict. The defendants will all be different. Your Onesimus will be different from mine, but the consequences of our judgment will be the same. Either we will further brotherly fellowship, or we will contribute to the division and destruction of fellowship. Now think back to the opening illustration just a few minutes ago as we started uh, this morning. Believers today are blood brothers in a far different sense than that practiced by those African savages we talked about. All who are in Christ are united with blood. We consequently share with one another and are in one another. Let us be thankful for this blessed fellowship. Let us adhere to the scripture's teaching so this fellowship will be protected. And we're running a little long this morning, so let me just quickly say that Monday we'll be back at 10 o'clock with morning mail. And we will continue in Philemon, verses 17 to 20. Also, let me remind you quickly, or inform you quickly, about our Sunday morning services. 9.30, Dale Hollingsworth will be teaching our Bible class in the auditorium. I encourage you to be present, if at all possible, or to tune in on Facebook. At 10.30, our worship service will, be, will begin with songs and prayers, with the communion service as we remember weekly, the 
uh, sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. The sermon will be coming from James chapter 1, verses 16, 17, and 18, and the lesson is entitled, How to Choose the Best Gifts. Now, Sunday afternoon, we will not have a regular Sunday afternoon service, but at 6 o'clock, our usual time, it is the second Sunday of the month, and so we will have a singing service. Now, there will be a short devotional toward the end of that time. Hope you can be with us for any or all of that, preferably live, in person. But if not, join us here on Facebook. It's good to be with you this morning. Let's close with a brief prayer, and then our time for today will be done. Gracious Father, thank you for the instruction that we've just been looking at, the reminders with regard to brotherly fellowship. What a tie that binds us all together. We sometimes sing, blessed be the tie that binds. And indeed, Father, that's true. Help us, Father, to reflect upon your word and the instructions with regard to our relationships with one another in Christ, that we might strengthen that fellowship and be strengthened by it that we might be the true united group of believers that you want us to be. We thank you for all of your word and for the Christ, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, you have a great Friday and Saturday. Lord willing, we hope to see you Sunday, uh, and for sure back here Monday morning.